welcome to the seventh annual Civil War and Emancipation Day. I'm Patrick Saylor. I'm the Director of Marketing and Public Relations for the American Civil War Museum. Our next speaker is Chris Smith. He's an archival assistant for the local records department at the Library of Virginia. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Virginia Commonwealth University with a major in history and a minor in African American studies. While attending VCU, Chris focused primarily on the 19th and 20th century Southern history with an emphasis on race, religions, uh, race relations excuse me, in the American South. In the summer of 2013, the VCU Undergraduate Journal of Research, Octus, published a paper of Chris's titled, The Last Mile of the Way, Soul Music and the Civil Rights Movement. Currently, Chris is working to complete his MLIS degree from Kent State University with a concentration in archival studies and digital collections management. Welcome, Chris Smith. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to be reading a lot of this because I found that uh, in the past, if I start to go off the cuff, this will be uh, a two-hour presentation as opposed to a 15 to 20-minute one. So forgive me. And I'm going to I'm going to blow through a lot of the uh, the the details of how we built this project um, and to focus more on some of the narratives that we found. So if I start speaking too quickly, uh, you know, please tell me to slow down but I want to make sure I get as much information out there to you guys as I possibly can. So um, I'm here to talk about the African American Narrative Project, which has now been formally titled uh, Virginia Untold, the African American Narrative. Um, I, I didn't have an opportunity to update this slide, so I apologize for that. Um, at the um, February 1st is when it went live, um, and I will provide a link to that uh, database uh, once this presentation is over. So in the early summer of 2013, the Library of Virginia received a grant from Dominion Power Foundation to pursue a project tasked with creating a database of the names of enslaved Virginians culled from our archival collections. Together with additional support coming from the LSTA Act, administered by the IMLS, work began on what would become Virginia Untold, the African American Narrative. Now, with the exception of Virginia Historical Society's Unknown No Longer project, we knew that there had been very few attempts at a project of this type, and possibly none with this scope. We also knew that we wanted to include the names of free African Americans in Virginia along with those enslaved. Quickly, we realized that the sheer size of our archival collections, which includes over 55 miles of shelving just in our Broad Street location alone, uh, would require us to plan for years of indexing names while conceptualizing and designing a database that can handle potentially millions of names along with millions of digital images. As with all grandiose projects, we needed a manageable starting point. Our local records division at the Library of Virginia, which oversees the processing and housing of the Commonwealth's county and city-derived records, seemed to be a logical place to begin as the collection included a variety of records pulled from all regions of the Commonwealth including areas of present-day West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. As a geographically and demographically diverse commonwealth, accessing materials from all areas of Virginia will allow us, would allow us to present the story of Virginia's antebellum African-American population from all angles. We also knew through years of processing these records that these records held a wealth of African-American names, both enslaved and free. Although we chose to start in only one division of our archives, the project will ultimately expand to include all the library's diverse materials. State records, uh, which we've already begun, they will be up within the next three or four months, a small portion of the state records. Um, private papers, newspapers, anything and everything that holds a name or a narrative relative to this project. Our first step was to identify the records most likely to have the names we were searching for. We very quickly were able to identify a healthy variety of record types, from inventories, free Negro registers, bills of sale, coroner's inquisitions. With many of these record types, we were discovering that there existed a complex narrative that would prove difficult to index while making connections across record types. And these narratives, we determined, should be the emphasis of this project. And when I say index, I'll clarify for you. That's, this is the process of, of building an index uh, relating to one particular record the horizontal line you see is one 
individual entry, all the vertical lines are all the different pieces of data we found from that one record. Um, and ideally, we'd want to make all those searchable, and I'll get to that in just one second. It was at this point in the development of the project that we chose to name the project the African American Narrative. It would eventually become Virginia Untold African American Narrative. The names we were indexing we found, they became starting points, bullet points in an outline of the lives of those many considered not human but property. The opening lines to narratives that had yet to be uncovered due to the period perspectives on the identities of enslaved and disenfranchised populations. Now, when creating a priority list regarding these records, we decided that initially we would focus on the records that helped to illuminate these stories. The African American narrative would also be a tool for those seeking information on their ancestors. We know that for many African American families, the family tree begins to fall apart when searching for data that predates 1865. We certainly see the genealogical value inherent in this project, but there's a lot more. Each record type required a careful examination, exploring all of the possible information we could glean from each piece of paper. Some records held a great wealth of information, up to 30 unique pieces of metadata for each entry. Free Negro certificates, for example, which is, uh, this is one of the indexes you see here. Um, these pieces of paper were required to be in the possession of all Virginia's free African Americans, or they ran the risk of being arrested and sold into slavery. These certificates would often give us a name, age, height, sex, physical descriptors such as skin tone, scars, birth defects, and even perceived its speech impediments if one existed. We may also find the origins of their freedom, whether they were emancipated, who they were emancipated by, or whether they were born free, who their parents or grandparents may be. This one particular record is a gold mine of information regarding one specific individual. As you can see from this example, uh, this is a free Negro certificate for a man named Jacob Myers. Uh, we get his mother's name, his mother's former owner, his age, complexion, occupation, and height, along with details regarding some scarring on his face. This was crucial information recorded by the clerks to ensure that the possessor of such a pass was indeed the free person. Lastly, if you look closely, you can see the creases where Jacob would have most likely folded up the certificate to keep it in his wallet or pocket just in case he was questioned. Some records would just have a single name, such as inventories or what we at the library defined as free Negro registers. I would like to add that the African American Narrative Collection website includes detailed descriptions of each record types that are currently available to search. Uh, that includes what, how they originated, uh, the legal purpose for them existing, and what information you may find in them. We also knew that regardless of the record type, we would index in an Excel spreadsheet any and all information that we could find from it, uh, whether it was relevant or not, anything. Um, and we would deal with what we would deem searchable down the road. So not every single detail we captured while indexing could be included in the database. So what we decided to do was to actually put these spreadsheets up on our website for people to download and manipulate and use as they please uh, for building other databases or for gathering a little bit more information from each particular record type. So somewhere around the two-year mark uh, of this project, when myself and another archival assistant had identified 28 specific record types with another 71 placed under a miscellaneous category, and indexed roughly 91,316 names and scanned 39,241 images, we began the discussion with our IT staff about the best possible practice for delivering these records to the public. Uh, I would like to note now that these numbers have risen. Uh, we're probably closer to 60 or 70,000 names and well over 100, or excuse me, well over 100,000 names and over 50 or 60,000 digital images. Um, we decided that we wanted to, you know, present these images uh, w to the public, but at the same time, we wanted to make them a little bit more accessible. Um, a lot of the records we were working with, as you can see from this one, uh, the handwriting's pretty, pretty crummy, and unless you have lots of time to sit down and go through these records, it's difficult to, to, for them to be legible to most people. Um, so we decided that we were going to use a transcription process. Um, and this is a crowdsourced thing that would make the images of these records available to the public online, which would allow them to read and transcribe the materials. Our archivists uh, would then review the transcriptions and make the necessary changes. 
the end result uh, would be a full text searchable record along with a transcribed copy of the record that's a little bit more legible for researchers and the public to use. Um, and, and this became the solution for those records we found with a complex narrative uh, that included detailed depositions, or codified language. It also serves the purpose of translating some pretty illegible handwriting into readable material. And it does work. Uh, we've had 15,000 pages transcribed and approved already, um, and we're, we're not even at the two-year mark. Um, we've had users from all over the country as well as Europe um, uh, participate in this uh, with, with an amazing amount of success. So we identify the record types. We index those, building that spreadsheet. Uh, then we digitize them. We scan them. And we organize them by locality and by what record type they are. Then we ingest them into this transcribe program, allow people to transcribe them. We take the PDFs of the transcribed record, and that goes into our database. Um, and that's a lot of archival jargon. Uh, but what I do want to share with you are some of the stories that we found, three in particular that struck me. And I'll move through these quickly. I'm not sure how we're doing here. Oh, OK, good. So I'm going to start with the story of Jane Webb. And again, this is a really good example of um, how difficult the handwriting is to read. Uh, this dates back to uh, early 1700s. So born of a white mother, she was a free mulatto woman, formerly called Jane Williams. In 1704, Jane Webb had a, quote, strong desire to intermarry with a certain Negro slave, commonly called and known by the name of Left. Webb informed Left's owner, Thomas Savage, a gentleman of Northampton County, of her desire to marry Left and made an offer to Savage. She would be a servant of Savage's for seven years and would let Savage, quote, have all the children that should be born upon her body during the time of her servitude, end quote. But for how long the children were to be bound is not clear. In return, Savage would allow Jane Webb to marry his slave, and after Jane's period of servitude ended, Savage would also free left. Also, neither Savage nor his heirs could claim any child born to Jane Webb and left after her period of servitude. Savage agreed to Jane Webb's offer, and an agreement was written and signed by both parties. Jane Webb fulfilled her part of the agreement and served Savage for seven years. During that time, she had three children with her husband left. After she completed her term of service in 1711, Jane Webb, quote, in a kindly manner, end quote, demanded her husband from Savage as well as her children, according to the document they had both signed together. Apparently, Jane Webb and Savage were at odds on how long the children she bore during her servitude were supposed to be bound to him, and Savage refused to free Left and the children. In April 1711, Savage submitted a letter to the county of Northampton requesting that Jane Webb's children be bound to him and his heirs, to which the court agreed. Eleven years later, Jane Webb filed a petition with the court pleading to the justices to free her children. That's the document you see here. Webb pointed out to the court her agreement with Savage and beseeched the court that, quote, the children being born in lawful wedlock may not be judged to servitude, end quote. She prayed that the court would not enslave your petitioner's children born as aforesaid. Thomas Savage was unable to or refused to appear in court to answer Webb's petition. On one occasion, he informed the court that he was too sick to attend. And so the case was continued until the next term and the next term and the next term until it was finally dismissed by the court. And the reason given, quote, plaintiff's argument dismissed as frivolous. A, a woman, a mother trying to get her children back. Um, I could go on with the details of this case, but I'm going to keep it short. Webb pursued her children's freedom through all means of the Commonwealth's court system, ultimately failed to ever gain custody of, of those children born with her husband left while under this period of servitude, and two additional she chil children she had after this period of servitude ended. So the two more children born after a period of servitude with Savage, uh, he ultimately sought custody of. His argument was that Jane had no means to support the children, so, quote, they may be induced to take ill courses. 
This is uh, the story of Charles Brown and Jacob Berryman. Uh, now this, this story is post-1865. We are opening up a dialogue about expanding this project to include some early reconstruction and Jim Crow era records as well. Warren County Coroner's Inquisition uh, contains a coroner's inquisition, which is kind of like CSI Virginia, so to speak. Um, when they found the dead body, they would uh, the county coroner would get together 12 upstanding land-holding white gentlemen and they'd all sit around and pass a flask and figure out how this body got there. Well, th this story, uh, this, is, this inquisition is dated the 20th of August, 1869. It notes the discovery of two bodies belonging to African-American males found hung to a tree in Front Royal. The coroner notes that, quote, the jail of Warren County was forcibly entered by six men in disguise, end quote, who removed two prisoners, Charles Brown and Jacob Berryman. They were carried away and lynched by the disguised men. Little information is given regarding the arrest of Brown and Berryman, so I did a little snooping around in the newspapers. The Stanton Spectator and Evening Star both mention the incident, but the Alexandria Gazette gives us the most detailed account of what happened, which is what you see here on the right. According to the Gazette, uh, which I scanned from microfilm, Brown and Berryman were arrested for assaulting a young girl named Alice Thompson. Little detail is given regarding the assault, except that she was hit and choked by Brown after being pursued into some thick woods. Once word got around that two African-American men had allegedly assaulted a young white woman, quote, the narration of this incident occasioned the most intense excitement, and threats of lynching the criminals was, were so current in the neighborhood that the jail for some days and nights was guarded by a strong force of armed men, end quote. This protection wouldn't last long, the Gazette notes that, quote, those they had protected probably met an awful fate, end quote. These men certainly accused of what amounts to a pretty heinous crime, but the community's outrage overrode a judicial system that was established to protect the rights of the accused until proven innocent beyond a reasonable doubt. This is the last story I'm going to tell. This is my favorite um, the story of Hester Jane Carr. You'll see that it mirrors a lot of... Um, Solomon Northup story that was depicted in 12 Years a Slave. So Richard R. Beasley and William H. Wood formed a partnership to purchase slaves in Virginia and sell them for a profit in Mississippi and Louisiana. Following the death of William Wood in 1845, Beasley was responsible for administering his estate. Wood's heirs sued Beasley, accusing him of mismanaging the settlement. Both sides in the suit provided the court with a substantial amount of testimony and exhibits which brought to light the operations of a slave trading business in Virginia. Through these court documents, we also learn information about the slaves who were bought and sold by Beasley and Wood. Filed in the suit is an account book dated 1835 to 1851 and was used by Beasley and Wood to keep track of the purchase and sale of slaves during their partnership. The majority of the volume consists of lists of slaves purchased in Virginia and sold to the Deep South, primarily Mississippi. The lists are divided by gender, and they include the name of the slave, the price of purchase, and the price of the sale. Some lists include ages, occupations, family relationships, and the name or residence of the individual who purchased the slave. While reviewing all the names of the slaves purchased and sold by Beasley and Wood, there was one name that stood out. An 1836 list of female slaves sold by Wood in Port Gibson. The last name on the list was Hester. She was purchased for $750, but unlike the other slaves listed, there was no selling price. Left-hand column is the name. Middle column is the purchase price. Right-hand column is the sale price. The very last name there is Hester. Also, you can see here, written next to her name was the word free. Towards the end of the account book, we found this notation, quote, the girl that's claiming her freedom by the name of Hester Jane is also in the concern if recovered, end quote. We did a search of the Library of Virginia's finding aids in the Virginia Heritage Database and discovered an EAD guide for a freedom suit heard in the Hustings Court of Petersburg, styled Hester Jane Carr versus Richard R. Beasley. The suit details an amazing but tragic story that involved the Beasley and Wood partnership. In her petition for freedom, real quickly, uh, freedom suits are, are a particular record type that we've included in this database that are my favorite. You hear a lot about violent slave uprisings, Gabriel, Nat Turner, et cetera. 
you rarely hear stories of these enslaved people using the court system to obtain their freedom, and they did, uh, a quite remarkable number. Uh, I believe we have close to four or 500 just in this project alone, and there's many more that we've yet to discover. So Hester Jane says, I'm a free person, and sues for her freedom. So in this petition for freedom, Hester Jane informed the Petersburg court that she was born in 1816, the free parents in Accomack County. Her father was Henry Tillman, and her mother was a former slave emancipated by a man named Carr, from whom her mother received her surname. Hester Jane's father moved to New York City, and he died while she was an infant. Her mother continued to live on the Eastern Shore until her death in 1832. Three years later, Hester Jane took a schooner from Accomack County to New York City and found work as a house servant for a Dr. James Cockcroft. She even provided the court the doctor's home address, Forsyth Street, number 24 in Lower Manhattan. On the 18th of July, 1836, Hester Jane met a woman who claimed to be from Columbus, Georgia, named Nancy Dawes. She wanted Hester Jane to come and work for her as a waiting maid, to which Hester Jane agreed. As they made their way from New York to Georgia, they reached Baltimore, Maryland, and Nancy informed Hester Jane that, quote, they were about to enter a slaveholding state, Virginia, in which the immigration of free persons of color was prohibited under severe penalties. In order to avoid arrest, Nancy told Hester Jane to, quote, represent herself, end quote, as Nancy's slave, to which Hester Jane complied. She posed as Nancy's slave all the way to Petersburg when their journey came to an abrupt end. To her great horror and dismay, she found that the said Nancy Donald had in violation of every principle of justice and humanity actually sold her to the said Richard Beasley as a slave and gone off with the money received from him. As shown in the Beasley Wood account book, Nancy sold Hester Jane to Beasley for $750, approximately $16,000 today's money. Now with the assistance of a local lawyer named William C. Parker, Hester Jane immediately filed suit in Petersburg for her freedom. Beasley was summoned to appear before the court, but refused. Hester Jane was placed in the custody of a local officer of the court, probably in the Petersburg City Jail, while her case was heard. Due to the turn of events, Beasley was unable to have Wood transport Hester Jane to the Deep South, along with the other slaves he had purchased in Virginia. That is the reason for the word free, found next to her name in the account book, along with no selling price. The case was continued with no hearings until March of 1837. The court found Beasley not guilty, which meant Hester Jane was declared to be his slave. Her lawyer immediately filed a repleter, claiming the verdict was flawed and requesting the case to be heard again, to which the court agreed. The trial came to an end two months later, not by a decision of the court or an acknowledgement by Beasley that Hester Jane was indeed a free person. It ended in May 1837 with her death, probably in the Petersburg City Jail, waiting for her, curse to, her case to be heard once more. She was 21 years old. Now these narratives function to illuminate the lives of those most left out of our common history texts. They're stories of people who experienced an existence that is absolutely unfathomable to me. Perhaps that's why I'm so enamored with this project. We're tying together narratives that cross many different record types that are all housed in different collections of the library throughout our archives uh, with hopes of illustrating the world of Virginia's pre-Civil War African American population while simultaneously providing access to rich genealogical material for those seeking information. We hope that this project eliminates roadblocks that African Americans find when researching their own past in Virginia while also encouraging conversation and engagement around the records, providing opportunities for a more grassroots and diverse narrative on the history of Virginia's African-American people. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I hope I have lots of answers. Yes, ma'am. I wish. Uh, tip of the iceberg. Um, so for the past 20 or so years, the li actually maybe even more than that, the library's been working on its chancery records. Um, and that, th digitizing those, I mean. Um, that's the primary function of the local records division right now. And chancery court, if you're not familiar, is a court of equity, not a court of law. So John sold me a cow. The cow didn't make any milk, I'm suing. And there's no crime infringed upon that. Um, 
so yeah, Chancery records are being digitized. The records that involve um, African American names for this project are being digitized. Um, I mentioned earlier that some of the state records were going to be included in this. That um, those are legislative petitions, um, which are fantastic. I can't wait to add those to this project. Um, that was the primary way for a civilian to interact with Virginia's government was to petition the General Assembly. Um, so those are being done, and we we have a massive amount of records that are digitized currently, just not even close to everything. <laughs> and, and our collection continues to grow, too, which is part of the problem. So, yes, sir. Um, that's a great question. Uh, for those who couldn't hear, he was asking about the, the percentage of people who actually found success in suing for their freedom um, or petitioning the courts for their, their rights. Um, I would argue that, that the majority of these individuals failed. Um, and that was because the burden was, was on them to prove. And we actually found this in a case from uh, Northumberland County or some, or Rockbridge, I can't remember. Um, I work on so many of these, it all starts to run together sometimes. Uh, where the, the judge actually outlines uh, or lays out the um, what the defend or what the plaintiff must prove in order to re retain their freedom. And in there is a statement that says, um, "It is assumed that all the world is their owner." Um, and that, of course, is if they were a black person, that all of the world is their owner, and it's up to them to prove that nobody owns them. So even if it's not the guy she's suing, somebody else may own her. Um, so th that sort of burden uh, was, was pretty tough to beat. Um, but we do notice a big concentration of these happened in Arlington and Alexandria counties in Northern Virginia, where there was a collection of um, abolitionist attorneys that would travel into Virginia and try and find these stories um, and, and, um, and help these individuals as advocates fight for their freedom. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Um, there are, um, I, I think it's often uh, assumed that that was primarily what happened when you see previously enslaved people or enslaved people with surnames that they would take on the last name of their owners. Uh, what we found is that really only happens in scenarios where the owners would actively free them, would emancipate them for either good service or a sort of ideological change um, that caused them to, to, to go against the institution of slavery. Um, more often than not, they would just pick a name that they liked, a biblical name or a name of a location um, uh, where they grew up. Um, but, but yes, we do see that. Um, as, you, as you can, Hester Jane Carr, um, her last name comes from her mother. Her mother took that last name from her previous slave owner. So that did happen quite a bit. But it was not always the case. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.